Hi, I'm Dan Puplett. I'm a naturalist, conservationist and environmental educator and I'm excited to be taking part in Foraging Fortnight, which is a celebration of Scotland's fantastic natural environment and wild foods. We're here at Marcusy Farm near Forres in Murray where we'll be taking a look, at, look around at some of the wild foods that are here and we'll also be heading down to the coast to see some of the things on offer there as well. Among the many things that I love about foraging is that it's a great way for people to reconnect with nature. It can help us get a better understanding of the plants, the wildlife and the broader environment around us and hopefully help to develop a, a greater sense of respect for nature as well. Being out in nature, engaged in activities like foraging can also be really good for our physical and our mental health and well-being. It's also a good way to get some free, nutritious and tasty ingredients too and something that can be accessible to anyone is we don't need to necessarily go that far there's often things right on our doorsteps that we can forage. And of course it almost goes without saying that when we forage we want to do it as safely and sustainably as possible so that means being 100% positive of the things that we're about to eat and also making sure that they're not from a contaminated source of any kind and in terms of sustainability of making sure that we're just not taking too much of anything and I tend to like focusing on the commoner species because then there's much less chance that we're going to have a negative impact. Ideally where possible we can even help to encourage wild places to thrive for the future so actually having a net positive benefit is something that foragers can do as well. And also when we're gathering it's important just to watch even where we're treading it can be easy to damage other plants without realising it. So just having that extra awareness um, not to create too much impact as we actually forage. So with that in mind let's go and see what treats are in store. This is among my favourite wildflowers at this time of year. This is creeping thistle and it's a really common thistle and easy to identify the flowers are quite a pale lilac colour and really fragrant as well and they make a delicious tea if you steep some of the flower heads in some just boiled water. The tea is really lovely, it has a quite a honey like flavour. Thistles including creeping thistle are really good for insects as well. Bumblebees, honeybees, butterflies and other insects really really like these flowers. So here we have a real treat for foragers. This is hazel and you can see it's got this fairly rounded, very bristly leaf with a point on the end. One of the key ID features though at this time of year are the actual nuts and this is another good year for hazelnuts. Last year was pretty good as well and so we've got a bumper crop on its way. One of the interesting things I find about hazelnuts is that there's been archaeological evidence found on the island of Colonsay and there were charred remains of hazelnuts from about seven and a half thousand years ago showing that people actually were um, cooking the hazelnuts by burying, burying them and having a fire on top as a way of cooking it makes them much more digestible so um, they've had a really long history of use in Scotland and that's a method I still use on some of my foraging courses and other things you can do with hazelnuts as well are making things like hazelnut butter which is absolutely delicious. Each hazelnut represents a real dense package of nutrients, of fats and proteins so because of that they're a really valuable source of food for wildlife including squirrels, various smaller rodents as well as birds including woodpeckers and others. These ones aren't quite ripe just yet but in a few weeks time they should easily be ready to harvest. Rose hips, as the fruits of roses are known, are another easy to identify wild edible. There are a few species of rose in this country and this one right behind me here is an introduced species called Rosa rugosa or the Japanese rose, sometimes known as the sea tomato. You can see why when you see these quite round hips that it has and these can often be found growing wild now along the coast they do pretty well there. 
it's quite well known that rose hips are really high in vitamin C, weight for weight, they have more than oranges even. And there's various ways that we can eat them. They can be eaten raw, but it's really important first to get rid of the seeds, because surrounding the seeds there are these irritant hairs, which is a really good idea to avoid. And that's one of the things I like about the sea tomato, is that it's quite easy to process and get rid of the seeds. So all we have to do is either cut or break open the fruit and inside we can see the seeds there. And then you can use a teaspoon or even just your thumb and scrape out with your nails, sc scrape out the, the seeds. This is if you want to pick and eat as you go along, making sure you got rid of all those hairs just by scraping them out. And then you have the skin and some of the pulp that were surrounding the seeds. And that is really tasty. It's quite sweet and a little bit juicy as well. The other kinds we have, like um, dog rose, which is one of our native ones, are really nice as well. They're just a bit more fiddly to process. An easy way to process the smaller dog rose hips is to actually make them into syrup. And there are quite a lot of um, recipes available to show you how to do that. And that was actually really encouraged during the Second World War. There was concern because citrus imports were limited. Um, there was concern that people would suffer from vitamin deficiencies, so people were encouraged to gather rose hips en masse and make syrup to provide vitamin C. There are quite a few of our wild roses, including the, the naturalised Rosa rugosa, that are good for bees. It tends to be that cultivated roses with lots of layers of petals aren't really accessible to bees but our, our wild ones are, and the hips are also valuable for birds as well. And it's quite common to find these, um, the sea tomatoes, that have been pecked open by finches getting at the seeds. You also see that with dog rose hips as well at times. And then there are birds like blackbirds and waxwings which really like the fruits, like the flesh of the fruit. So certain birds go for the flesh and certain birds go for the seeds. This tree right behind me here is really easy to identify at this time of year in late summer with these clusters of bright orange red berries. It also has this compound leaf, so there's a central stalk and pairs of leaflets alongside making up the whole leaf. And rounds yet another wild plant that's really high in vitamin C and it's not a good idea though to eat the berries raw apart from tasting pretty grim, they actually contain a chemical which can give you stomach upsets. But if you cook them, the chemical is destroyed and they're fine to eat. The classic way to eat round berries is in round jelly, which is this really sharp jelly that's traditionally served with game, with lamb. It's nice with cheese as well. The flowers of rowan are pollinated by various flies and other insects. And the berries themselves, as you can probably imagine, are really popular with birds, particularly migrant thrushes such as red wings and field fares when they arrive in early autumn, really feast on these berries. And when we get wax wings over, they also love rowan berries too. There's a lot of folklore associated with the rowan across the British Isles, and it's often thought of as a tree that protects against evil. And in the Scottish Highlands, it's quite common to see houses that have a rowan tree planted out the front and that was, they were thought to have protective properties and there's even a taboo against cutting down rowan trees. We're here on the fantastic Murray coast and it's a brilliant place for wildlife as well as for wild food foraging. So we're gonna go on a bit further and find one of my favorite coastal plants. Just behind me on the bank here, we have one of my favourite coastal wild edibles. This is scurvy grass all up here, and I'll show you a bit closer. So it's not a grass at all, as you can see. This is actually a member of the cabbage or mustard family. And when it's in flower, it has these little four-petaled white flowers. 
and other members of that family also have four petaled flowers. And the leaf has this kind of heart or kidney shaped leaf that's really succulent as well. And this one up on the bank here, this patch, is well out of the dog zone so it's safe to eat. And it's really succulent and has a flavour a lot like horseradish. It's kind of like salty horseradish. Really like it and it's really nice mixed through a salad with other leaves. Um, as you probably can guess from the name, um, it was used in the past as a source of vitamin C. It was used by mariners a lot. But people have been at sea for long periods of time, not been able to get much vitamin C and so when they got to land, this would be a really welcome source of that vitamin. And um, there's reports of it being used on Captain Cook's expeditions and others. It's also been used over the centuries by various island and coastal communities in Scotland, particularly at times when other vegetables might have been scarce, so a really important way to, to supplement the, the people's diet. So thanks very much for watching. I hope you enjoy your time getting out there and getting involved in some safe and sustainable foraging.